making room in our hearts and our minds, making space on a Sunday morning to connect with the Lord, to worship, to hear from God can be difficult. There's so many messages and so many things going on. There's ice to be melted. There's groceries to be gotten. There's so many things happening. The lives of the people we love, maybe we're helping or concerned, maybe we've got health things. There's so many things. And often what happens is we have learned in church or the message that we've received along the way is you're supposed to leave that stuff outside of church. You know, leave that at home Dress up, come to church, pretend like everything's good, do some churchy kind of things, please God, and then go about your business. But that is not what God invites us to. He wants, because He knows our every move, He knows, Scripture says, our needs before we do. He knows the length of our days and how many hairs are on our head. There's nothing that we can't bring into God's presence even the things that we're embarrassed or ashamed to talk to other people about, that he not only doesn't already know, but wants to talk to us about. And that's what this time of preparation is for, that we can bring all of our lives, our whole selves, everything that's on our mind and our heart, the things we're excited about, the things that we're worried about, the things that we're suffering through, and the things that we, are, uh, the things that we are, have victory over, all of those things are welcome, and more importantly, that's what this time is for, to bring all of our lives and our whole selves into worship with the Lord. It can be a medical test. It could be a test at school. It could be a bill that has to be paid. It could be being worried about getting your taxes done. It's starting to get about that season. It could be whatever it is going on in your life. You, all of that is welcome here in the presence of the Lord. So I'd like you to take just a minute before uh, we begin to pray together, and I pray the Lord's Prayer, for you to acknowledge in God's presence and just maybe the thing that you're most excited about, the thing that you're most grateful for in your life right now, and the thing that has you most concerned. Why don't we take a, just a few moments of silence to bring those things into worship with us as we approach God's Word? Lord, your word reminds us that when we are in line with your will, when we are hearing from you and receiving all the good things that you have intended for us in our lives, that everything in our life and all of our prayers are yes and amen because they are done in accordance with you. They're in agreement with what you are already interceding for us in heaven. And so, Lord, as we come to this time of preparation, we bless you and we thank you that you not only know our needs, but you are providing for us, protecting us, caring for us. And because of that, Lord, give us the confidence to boldly come before you as whole people with whatever we are struggling with, whatever we are rejoicing about, because you love us unreservedly. Lord, for those that can't make it this morning, for those who are at home and who are sick, we lift them up to you. We ask, Lord, that you would visit them with your presence. Would your word come alive to them this morning? Would you remind them of your care and your love for them wherever they're at and whatever they are doing? Lord, for those who uh, are suffering this winter from loneliness, from isolation, those that are suffer. Uh, be, with seasonal effectiveness issues. Lord, we ask that you would lift their spirits by your Holy Spirit, that you would give them joy that doesn't come from them, from their feelings or what they are thinking, Lord, but joy that overwhelms and surprises them that you give to them as a, as a gift. Lord, would you minister to them even as we pray this morning. 
Lord, for those who are uh, serving our country, including Nathan Winter and Christian Yoder, would you keep them safe? Thank you, Lord, for all of those who might be in harm's way, even as we pray right now. Protect them and bring them back home to their loved ones safely. And most importantly, Lord, would you help them to know that you are their Savior, that you love and care for them, and you can, they can rely on you. So we ask and pray for them as well this morning. And Lord, for ourselves, as we come to your word, I realize, Lord, that we don't understand who you are and your goodness and kindness and love, your generosity and your grace, your righteousness and your mercy toward us. And so, Holy Spirit, would you open our hearts to see with fresh eyes you again? Would you enliven our hearts and open our ears so that we might be brave enough to hear you speaking to us through your word and even through one another? Lord, would you visit us with your very presence, even as we worship you in your word. And so as we prepare to do so, Lord, thank you for the words that we pray now that you taught us yourself by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, Christmas is over. It's been over for a few weeks now. And many of you, no doubt, have been putting away Christmas decorations and trying to f make sure that all of the returns were made and all of those things that go along with Christmas. This week, we had a team of folks on Thursday come and take down the Christmas tree and put away all of the nativity scenes and return things back to normal, I guess. But after we were done... There were holes everywhere. What are we going to put where the tree was? Where all those lights glowed so warmly. What about that over there? What are we going to put on? Everything seemed just a little more empty, even a little cold. And it made me stop and think, even as we were carefully putting the nativity uh, sets away in their boxes. Each one has its little cutout in the styrofoam, and we were struggling to figure out what went where. It made me think of how easily we put Christ away after Christmas. And so we come to our second week in our sermon series, And the Child Grew. We're learning lessons from the early life of Jesus because most of us turn off Christmas and Jesus and the things that he has to tell us after Epiphany, after the wise men come it seems like Jesus doesn't have much to teach us, but Scripture has something else to say to us about that. So this morning is actually the second part of our Epiphany series. Believe it or not, Epiphany and the wise men, they don't just last one day. There's enough there for us for two weeks. And so we have the second week talking about Epiphany and the Magi. I wonder, though, when was the last time you got down on your stomach, on your face, on the ground? Isn't that an odd question? Well, maybe some of you have, maybe some of you have New Year's resolutions, and so you've been doing some exercises, I don't know, push-ups or other things, so maybe you've been on the ground recently. But if I said the word belly crawl to you or hit the deck, what image do you picture? What do you conjure up? when I say belly crawl or hit the deck. That's okay, Edith, if you want to answer, it's fine. Lying down, right? I learned to belly crawl. I really learned to belly crawl, not when I was young and obviously couldn't walk yet, but when I was training to go into the Marine Corps. So I was training in the Marine Reserves, and they taught me how to belly crawl. And they mainly taught me by putting a boot 
on my back to get us down further. Because most of us, in some way, we're trying to crawl with our backs and kind of arch in an arched way. But a belly crawl is getting down in the dirt and just using your arms to pull you forward so that you stay out of harm's way. Now, one of the ways that we talk about that, too, is hit the deck. If something happens suddenly that seems like danger, we automatically hit the deck, we say. But I wonder, when was the last time you actually were on the ground, on your belly, on your face? It's not something we do, hardly ever, unless you're a crazy gym person. And it's okay, we love you too. But we're going to find out this morning that all of our figurines and all of our nativity sets are wrong. We talked about that a little bit about that last week. And this week we're going to discover a few more things that we've gotten wrong about Epiphany. Now, if we remember, the word Epiphany means to shine a light on something. It comes from the Greek and it means literally to light something up or to show or to reveal. And what we're discovering is that in as much as the epiphany is about Jesus appearing, a light being shown on Jesus, maybe even literally the star that came to rest over where he was, was showing the world that the Messiah had come, so too a light shines on us and who we are and the presence of God is revealed to us as well. So with those reminders about Epiphany, let's open Scripture this morning. Back to Matthew chapter 2 and verses 1 through 12. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all of Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all of the peoples, the Jewish peoples, chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. Then Herod called to the Magi secretly and found out for them the exact time that the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem, and he said, Go! And search carefully for the child, and as soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them, and they, and the star that they had seen, I lost my place, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. And on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down, and they worshipped him. They opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So even this week as I was pondering all of the empty spaces that are left after Christmas, I thought how strange it is to observe a holiday. How strange it is to observe a holiday. If you think about this, How much of your life changed preparing for the Christmas holiday? We change who we spend time with. We change what we wear, colors and kinds of clothing. We change what we eat. 
We change how we spend money. We change what we drink, what we decorate our houses with, how we spend our time, what we do in church. If you observe Christmas in any way, you can't get away from it. We change what we listen to, what we talk about. It's kind of weird. It's like a sudden madness has descended on the United States, some people starting all the way in September, and we're kind of crazy people who have nothing to do with Jesus at all in their life. And we change all of these things for a short time. But most of us, by this time in January, everything is back to normal. Isn't that weird? But Christmas isn't over yet because Christmas isn't a holiday. Christmas is the reality that Jesus, the Son of God, has come to earth. He himself, both God and man, and is li has lived and showed us how to live and died and rose from the dead and whose spirit is here now helping us to live his life. That never goes away. It's not a holiday. It's a reality that has changed everything. And that's the first lesson that we learned last week from the Magi. God coming and living and dying and rising from the dead among us has changed everything. And the Magi were in on it early, and they changed everything about their lives. They reoriented themselves around this magnificent birth. They risked much, and they reoriented their lives around not who they even knew Jesus to be, just around the promise of maybe the Messiah, a king, a savior of the Jewish people. On so little a promise, they reoriented their whole life and made that journey. And so we ended last week by asking, what three things is God calling you to? Certainly, he is still present, and if he's changing everyone's life that he comes into contact with, including the Magi, including yours and mine, what three things is God calling you to change in your life? How is he calling you to reorient your life so that his presence isn't forgotten after November? Uh, December the 25th. I wonder how you answered that. One of the things that I asked you to do was to talk to other people about it. Maybe your spouse or somebody at work, a friend or a neighbor. I wonder if you had those conversations. If you did, I'd love to hear about them. But if not, that's okay. Now is the time to remember what was even just one of those things that God was calling out to you about. How is God calling you to reorient your life around the fact that he is with you, with you and I, even now present. How is God calling us to be changed by that reality? And so we look again at our text for the second lesson from the Magi. One of the things we also looked at last week was how much of what we thought we knew about the Magi is wrong. We just get it completely wrong. Right? They're not three kings, even though we heard the carol a little bit this morning during the offering. They weren't kings. They were astrologers. Right? There weren't three. We don't know how many there are. There could have been three, but there could have been less. There could have been more. There's lots of things that we have gotten wrong about the Magi. These astrologers from the East. There's another thing that we get wrong, too. I want you to think about all of the pictures you've ever seen about the Magi. Even maybe you can think if you have a nativity set at home. How many of you have a nativity set at home, even if you don't always put it up? So you're at least familiar. Have you seen a nativity set? If you think about, generally, you have three men who are depicting the Magi. What is their posture? How are they situated? Generally, you'll find one is sort of bending over. I'll have to come forward so you can see this. One is generally bending over, and they all have their gifts right. One is, uh, another one is generally 
kneeling down, and then there's another one in another awkward position that you'll never find yourself in in real life. And they all have their gifts in front of them. But that's not what Scripture says. If we turn to Matthew chapter 2, In verse 11, it says, On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Which is wrong. They translated it wrong. They do that a lot. They, a lot of times what happens in the translations is they translate it pretty close, something that people would, everyone would understand, no matter your background or where you come from. So they kind of flatten it so that everyone can understand but what that word really means, it means hit the deck. It means they were on their faces. The word that we use in English, and we don't use it very often, is prostrate. Not the other one, minus another R. To be prostrate. It means to lay down completely on your face. Now, I got very undignified in the first service. Actually, I could have some dust. And I showed folks what that looked like because we just don't see it very often. And I'm not going to do it this morning because we televised this. And so I don't want our friends and neighbors watching on television to think that we are any weirder than we really are. Someone who is lying face down completely, literally with their face into the ground, hands out like this. The word means to fall down not to bend down, not to bow, not to reverently, those of you who grew up Catholic, not to do the quick touch and go genuflect, right? It means to be prostrate, completely flat out. And it doesn't mean to get there easily. It means they hit the deck, they fell down, and they worshiped. Now, there's only a few times in life when we do that, and it's generally when we are powerless, when we are children, we don't have to walk yet. We're crawling on our bellies, right? When we're in danger or when you're in war and you're trying to avoid danger, you hit the deck like I learned how to belly crawl. Maybe it's when we fall because we're not as stable or steady as we used to be or we're looking for something. It's just not something that we normally do. Something else compels us to get down on our faces. Or if you're like Jack, you fall out of bed. The, the lesson that the Magi teach us is that we end up becoming like what we worship. Who did they fall on their faces about and for? An infant, a baby who couldn't walk yet. And it doesn't say that they approached him very reverently and regally. We have sort of this weird, very religious kind of overtones that come out of the Middle Ages that they, you know, they had capes and things and crowns and they do this very solemn thing. That's not what happened. They were floored. They came into this house thinking they were going to see a baby. They found the living God, and they were terrified like just about everyone else, the shepherds and the angels. That's why they always say, peace, don't be afraid. They hit the deck. So I wonder this. If that's what that means, and we get it wrong in our nativity scenes, what do we call this that we come to do on Sunday morning? We call it worship, don't we? Worship literally means to prostrate yourself in humility, to, be, to make yourself vulnerable. I wonder if maybe what we call worship isn't really worship. Not because we're bad people or because we're doing it wrong but because we're afraid to encounter God like that. I wonder if you have really ever encountered God in such a powerful way that you're unable to talk about it, that it makes you weak at the knees, that you are overwhelmed, just like the Magi were when they saw the star. 
They were overcome, unable to be, speak, struck dumb, as it were. I wonder if you have ever experienced God in that way. We call this worship what we do, but are we worshiping? Certainly we're singing, we're giving, we're doing things that we're taught to do. I say very nice, beautiful words, at least I try, I try. Which is why sometimes I have to go longer because I don't get it the first time. I have to repeat myself. But if we were really worshiping, wouldn't we hit the deck a little more often? And I wonder if it's this. I wonder if it's preachers like me and church experiences that we've had in the past where our expectation has been lowered so much that we don't expect to find God. We don't expect to encounter the living presence of the creator of the world and the savior of our souls. I wonder if it's, we've done it so often and haven't encountered it that we've delayed the expectation that that's probably what's going to happen when we die and we go to heaven. But the Magi teach us, teach us that whenever we are in the living presence of God, we are overcome and we worship. I wonder if it's ever happened to you. Maybe it has. I want to tell you about the, time, the first time that it ever happened to me. Now, I was a teenager. I was in seventh grade, barely a teenager. And uh, I, was, I was a weird kid. I was a really religious kid. So I went to the Catholic church, and I was an altar boy, and I was the head of the altar boys, and I was trying to get a youth group started in the Catholic church because we didn't have one. And so I went to pray rosary with the old ladies, and then I was part of the evangelical free church at the same time. And I went to youth group there, and I did the Bible studies there. The cutest girls were there, so of course I was there. I went to the Nazarene church, and we did Bible study and some weird stuff. They were, you know, they were strange people, but they loved God, and I was there too. I was a weird religious kid. And so one of the things that I did was I was in a traveling choir called Teens Living for Christ. So this is in the 80s. This is in the era of Amy Grant and Michael W. Smith and Sandy Patty. This is when very earnest evangelical white people like me wanted to tell everybody about Jesus. And so we would dress up in khaki pants the guys did. We had khaki pants and white shirts and a tie on, and the girls wore flower dress and big, you know, it was 80s, so it was big hair. And we earnestly got up and sang about Jesus and t gave our testimonies. We were so white and so from up north, northern Michigan. And we traveled all around, and we were quite earnest. And it was wonderful. It was actually wonderful, and we touched a lot of people, and, and it was good. But I wasn't worshiping. You know how I knew this? Because we went once to Chicago. We went to the Rock of Our Salvation Evangelical Free Church of West Chicago, Illinois, and I'm glad I don't have to put that title on my letterhead. That was the name of the church, the Rock of Our Salvation Evangelical Free Church of West Chicago, Illinois. And it was an African-American church on the west side, and we were going there to do a little bit of worship, uh, to do a little bit of mission projects. So they had a, a block of houses that used to be projects that they were converting into transitional housing. And so we were doing some work there. And then on Sunday, we were going to sing with their choir, which is about 100 people, African-American choir. Now, I don't know why the 15, uh, these 15 white kids from northern Michigan were there. The three ladies in the front row of the choir could have drowned us 20 out because we didn't know how to sing. They just made a huge, wonderful noise. It was beautiful. And then there were three men from Togo, West Africa. They, were, they sang a cappella, three guys, African guys, and they were there too. So we had these really white kids who didn't know anything about the world singing about Jesus. We had this humongous African-American urban choir and these three guys from Togo, West Africa. And we each did two songs during the service, and then the last song we all sang together, and it came uh, from Revelation 19. It goes, hallelujah, salvation and glory, honor and power to the Lord our God. And it goes over and over and over again like that, and it splits up into parts. And boy, that director was amazing. We were doing, it was, it was like dancing while we were singing. At some point, 
I'm singing in this very, it's the first time I've ever been in an African-American church. It's just, I, everything was new to me. We were very earnest, you know, we were in our little white shirts and ties, and it's pretty funny to think about now. But all of a sudden, about the second time we got through, hallelujah, salvation and glory, I just felt a weight. It felt like, I don't know what it was, that my knees were buckling. I felt like I couldn't stand up. And I couldn't sing. I didn't know what was happening to me. I couldn't sing. And I'm sitting there, and I was kind of in the center. And I was one of the white people, so I really stood out. I was in the middle. We were in the middle of the sanctuary up front. I don't know how many people. There were hundreds of people. It was a fairly large church there. And I can't sing, and I feel like I'm going to fall down. And I didn't know what to do. And it dawned on me that it was God. And now, this is an evangelical free church, and even though it was African-American, they didn't put their hands up very often. Like in our congregation, there were just a few weirdos who raised their hands every once in a while. I'm, I'm one of those weirdos. And here it doesn't happen at all. Over on the other side, it happens every once in a while. So I just put my hands up. And as soon as I did it and realized that I was worshiping God, all of a sudden I could stand again and tears began to flow and I sang my heart out. Afterwards, of course, all of these great ladies, these church ladies came up to me and they, were, they could see that something was going on with a white kid in the middle. God was also tall. Uh, and they, oh, you blessed me. And they came and they were making a big deal about it. But nobody told me what happened. Nobody could describe to me, nobody could say, oh, this is what happened. You were worshiping. That was you feeling God's presence. And you know, when I looked this morning, or uh, looked when I was preparing for this morning, this week, I looked for how to worship at home. I, th I was for sure I'd get a, a wider range of ideas and books on it. I didn't find anything. After about three pages of Google search, I looked, and there was this one thing buried in a paragraph on somebody's blog about worshiping on your own, not in church. And what I realized is that we have assumed that people know what's happening. We've assumed that people realize and understand and know what worship is. And because of that, nobody really knows what's going on, and our expectations about meeting with God are lowered. But the good news is this. God will meet with us. And we all can have a worship experience, and I mean the biblical sense of worship, where we are overcome because God is that present. Christmas doesn't go away at Christmas. The same Jesus who inhabited the world then inhabits the world now. Even more, we have this presence of the Holy Spirit with us. So I wonder if the message of the Magi isn't this, raise your expectations that you could actually worship and encounter God. I wonder if we raised our expectation that the God of the universe who created us, who came to live and show us what life means and then die so that we might be free and so that we might live forever without any barriers in his presence, Maybe he's going to uh, raise our expectations that we could hear him say our name. To say your name. What would it be like to hear God say your name? Or to feel his presence so much that physically you get it. Or to be so overcome by a thought or a revelation that comes out of Scripture, or even as you're singing a song, that your speech goes away. Or maybe, like one of the few wonderful, blessed people whose bodies actually respond by being healed or restored or freed in some way by the presence of God in their life. I wonder if the message of the Magi isn't that worship in worship, we can expect to hit the deck more often than we do. So I want to give us 
a challenge. There's other things that we could talk about this morning, but I've already gone on too long. I want to give us a challenge. And I'd like us to pretend for a minute that Christmas isn't over. That Jesus is still present on the earth and the Holy Spirit means that we're never outside. We don't have to journey to Bethlehem. We don't have to be in the actual house where Jesus is. But because of the Holy Spirit, that same Jesus is present to us in all ways, in all places. And that maybe we could take 20 minutes this week to spend in worship. And I mean this in a different way. I don't mean in doing a devotional time. I don't mean reading the Bible. Those things are all good. I don't even necessarily mean listening to music. But most of the time what we do is we carve out a few minutes or a, a time, and it's so filled with us, what we're thinking, wanting, feeling. We're wrestling, trying not to get distracted. We're trying to figure out what the word means. We're doing like our nativity scenes. We're busy running around, but we don't spend time with the one who's changed our lives. Just think of this. How much time and energy and money and things did we change around Christmas? Weeks and weeks, some of you months. Those of you who are holy like me observe Advent and then you celebrate Christmas starting on the 24th. You are holy. Everybody else isn't. You'll learn. You'll learn next year. It's okay. But think about how much time and energy we spent. And let me ask you this. How much time did you personally spend with Jesus over Christmas? Maybe you came to a service. Maybe you spent some time reading the story again. But think about all of the time that you spent celebrating Christmas and how much time we spent with Jesus himself. Take 20 minutes this week. Don't fill it with your prayers, your worries, your anxieties, your prayer list, but put your focus on him. However is helpful for you. It could be through music. Maybe music helps you do that. That's fine. It can be contemporary, traditional. If you listen to a few worship songs, you know, contemporary, we won't bar you from coming in. You're still welcome here. You won't get kicked out of the choir. Or maybe it's traditional hymns. Maybe those help you feel God's presence and connect to God. Maybe it's in Scripture. Maybe you just connect with God there. Maybe it's just by quieting yourself and realizing that God is present with you. What if you could carve out 20 minutes this week? But with expectation of really worshiping, of maybe hearing God say your name personally. Jack or Betty or Yvonne or Dave. Maybe feeling God's presence physically. Maybe having your hope or your joy restored. But in some way, you are changed. And like the thing that we worship, we become like what we worship. And so... When they hit the deck, they were like babies crawling. I wonder how you are going to be changed. How will other people know that you've been in God's presence? A lot of times we, we think about people that we want to believe like us or to have experiences of God, and so we, tell, we try to convince them and give them an argument about why God exists or, or Jesus is the Son of God, or we want to invite them to church, or we want to do all these other good things or invite them to read the Bible or something like that. But the most convincing thing is if you yourself worship, people will know it, just like the Magi. Herod and the chief, they knew what was going to happen. They could tell. It even changed them, for them in the negative. But the most compelling thing that you can do, the biggest witness that you can be, is by you yourself, yourself spending time in worship and being changed being transformed into the likeness of the one that we worship. So take 20 minutes this week. Here's a quote. We'll end with this that I love from Garrett Gustafson. If you truly meet God, you will worship. And if you truly worship, 
others will be drawn to God too. May that be true in our lives this epiphany season and always. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that you do not leave us on our own, that we don't have to become worthy, we don't have to clean ourselves up, we don't have to somehow perform religious rituals, we don't have to obey the laws perfectly for you to come to us and for us to experience your transforming presence. So Holy Spirit, I pray over each one of us this week, would you help us carve out time, and not just time, but would you increase our expectation of meeting with you? Dispel from our hearts and minds the lies that say that we are not good enough or holy enough or clean enough, somehow not worthy enough to be in your presence. Would you also dispel the lies that it's not for us, that we have to wait till we die, that God really doesn't encounter people that way, that it's not for me, but instead would you increase our faith, our hope, our joy, that we can experience your transforming presence and we will be changed. We can't do that on our own, so Holy Spirit, do that work in us not only for our good, but for the sake of Jesus who loves us and whom we love and in whose name we pray. Amen. I forgot to mention that if you need help getting into that place of worship, a good place to start is Psalm 8 or Psalm 95. Those are beautiful psalms to get us started on our worship. Receive this blessing. May you be visited by the very presence of Jesus. And may his presence enkindle in you the expectation and the joy of being loved and transformed by the king of the universe, even Jesus Christ himself. And may you go in that peace. Amen.